Good evening, everyone. I'm Trey Johnson, museum educator for the Kansas Historical Society, and we are coming to you live from the Kansas Museum of History. Thank you all so much for joining us for our monthly virtual Museum After Hours program. And let me tell you, we have an incredible presentation lined up for you tonight. Our program will be followed by a question and answer period with our presenter. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen or the chat feature to post your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Brent Campney, Professor of History at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Campney earned his master's degree in American studies at the University of Kansas and his PhD in American studies at Emory University. He is the author of This Is Not Dixie, Racist Violence in Kansas, 1861 to 1927, and Hostile Heartland, Racism, Repression, and Resistance. He has published many scholarly articles in venues like Western Historical Quarterly, Journal of Southern History, Pacific Historical Review, and Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. The focus of tonight's presentation will be on Dr. Campney's book, This Is Not Dixie, Racist Violence in Kansas, 1861 to 1927. Often defined as a mostly Southern phenomenon, racist violence existed everywhere. Brent Campney explodes the notion of the Midwest as a so-called land of freedom with an in-depth study of both active and threatened assaults faced by African-Americans in post-Civil War Kansas. His definition of white on black violence encompasses not only sensational demonstrations of white power like lynchings and race riots, but acts of threatened violence and the varied forms of pervasive routine violence used to intimidate African-Americans. Campney's broad consideration of racist violence lends new insights into the ways people resisted threats and helps to rewrite fundamental narratives on mob action, race relations, African-American resistance, and racism's grim past in the heartland. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brent Campney. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for hosting me. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've given a talk since the pandemic started, so uh, it's nice to, to get back out and, and do that. Uh, I'm going to speak tonight very generally on the subjects of anti-Black violence in Kansas in the decades after the Civil War uh, and the way that African Americans in the state responded to this violence. Uh, and before I do that, I just wanted to sort of define briefly what I mean by racist violence. Uh, a lot of people use the term racial violence. Uh, and to me, that implies any kind of violence between groups that are sort of constructed as being in different, uh, different racial groups. Uh, by racist violence, what I mean is a type of violence uh, perpetrated by the dominant group whites uh, to create and sustain a white dominated society. Uh, this was very important to white Kansas at the end of the Civil War uh, because it's a new state and they haven't really established a social order in which whites dominate. Uh, it's, it's violence that's about subordinating African Americans uh, to white rule uh, and it's uh, endorsed effectively by white people at all levels of society. So white uh, citizens participate in this violence, the police don't do anything to stop the violence, the court system doesn't prosecute or doesn't punish people uh, who participate in this violence. Uh, race, racist violence exploded at the end of the Civil War, uh, particularly 1864, 1865, through about 1872 or 1873, uh, as whites, as I said, aimed to consolidate a white supremacist social order in a new young state where the social order was very much in flux. Uh, just to give you an example of how bad things were in the mid to late 1860s, uh, in just a couple of months between March uh, 1867 and June 1867, there were nine African-Americans uh, men lynched in the state of Kansas in four separate incidents in rural Dickinson County, in Fort Scott, in Wyandotte, and in Shawnee. Uh, and that's by far the most lynchings concentrated into the shortest period in the state's history. So while most of the cases that I'm gonna to discuss tonight come from the late 19th century or the early 20th century, I just wanted to stress that racist violence was perhaps at no time more common 
uh, than in the decade or so immediately following the Civil War. Reconstruction was very bloody indeed uh, in Kansas. Uh, between 1864 and 1874, for instance, lynch mobs in Kansas killed at least 33 black men in 21 separate incidents. Uh, and racist violence remained very common occurrence throughout the entire period, well into the 20th century, with another major surge around the turn of the century. So 1890 to about 1905 were especially bad years, uh, and particularly the years right around the turn of the century. Uh, 1899, 1900, 1901, 1902, very, very bad years. Okay, so I'm going to start out talking about uh, several different types of racist violence. Uh, and the first one of these, and the one that most of you are probably most familiar with, is lynching. And so a lynching is, uh, it has a whole lot of definitions. It's a very contentious uh, concept to define, but I'm defining it here as a white mob killing an African American under the pretext of serving justice on behalf of an aggrieved white community. So an African-American person is accused of committing either some kind of criminal infraction, usually rape or murder, uh, or they're accused of some kind of infraction against the racial order, against white supremacy. Uh, and so they're executed. At the time that I published This Is Not Dixie in 2015, I reckoned that there had been about 52 African-American men, all men, by the way, lynched in Kansas over 37 uh, incidents between 1861 and 1927. And I've actually found a few more recently. I've been doing some more research, which should be published uh, next year. But I found four more incidents, all in the 19-teens and 1920s. Uh, so... If you were to read, this is not Dixie, uh, the suggestion would be that the number of lynchings declines very dramatically in the 20th century. And I think I could probably suggest that maybe it didn't decline as much as I had originally thought. Uh, lynchings are nakedly about racist terror. They're about intimidating uh, the entire African-American population with one cruel calculating act. Uh, involving torture, involving a public spectacle, uh, you know, really putting the fear of God into the entire African-American community and keeping that population subordinated. Uh, okay, so as I, as I indicated a moment ago, I think the numbers now, as I, as I have identified it, we have 56 African-American men murdered in 41 separate incidents, uh, now between 1861 and 1930. Uh, lynchings were spectacular, as I, can, as I indicated, almost by definition, these were public events, right? So they happen in public. Uh, sometimes there are crowds of hundreds or thousands of people who participate or watch. Uh, sometimes a smaller group of people will lynch somebody and leave uh, his body hanging there. And then, you know, hundreds or thousands of people come witness the scene, tear the clothing off the body, take photographs, uh, and so on. So it's this spectacle uh, of murder. Uh, Lynchings tended to unify white communities, or at least to give the appearance that they were unifying white communities. So people at all levels of the white population participate in these events, from laborers to the, the elites. Uh, the, new, the police officers sometimes participate. Uh, at the very least, they don't do anything to stop it. There are no arrests. Uh, sometimes these events occur in broad daylight and the white people feel no need to wear masks because they know they're not gonna be prosecuted. They know that they're not gonna be arrested. And they know frankly, in many of these cases that the white population generally is gonna celebrate uh, their acts. Uh, <clears throat> one, probably the most notorious lynching in Kansas history, certainly the most notorious lynching in Kansas history takes place in Leavenworth in 1901. And even though it's an outlier of a case, it's sort of unlike most of the other lynchings, it's a really good example of some of these things. So this occurs in January of 1901. Uh, it's an alleged rape and murder, uh, a couple of different rapes, uh, followed by an alleged rape and murder. And for days, the city of Leavenworth is uh, under control of a mob. Thousands and thousands of white people in the streets. Uh, they surround the local jail, the county jail. They go out to Lansing, to the state jail. They eventually get their hands on this alleged murderer and rapist, Fred Alexander, who is almost certainly, and certainly in fact, innocent of all the charges against him. Uh, they take him again in broad daylight. They put him in a wagon, take him with ease from the police. They take him to the site of his alleged crime. 
Uh, they chain him to a stake and they pour gasoline on him uh, and burn him alive. Uh, the site where this occurs is actually just a couple of hundred yards from his family home. So his mother and father and siblings all watched this happen and eventually had to close the, 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 the windows to avoid hearing and seeing what was happening uh, to their, their, their son and brother, Fred. Uh, and eventually the, the mother and some of the sisters came out of the house and came down and saw uh, Fred Alexander burned at the stake and screamed and cried and were basically taunted by the whites on the scene. Uh, really a utterly grotesque uh, incident. And of course, in this case, nobody is prosecuted. Everyone knows who's involved and nobody's prosecuted for it. Uh, in that particular instance as well, and it's not clear how often this happened, the mob certainly castrated uh, Fred Alexander before executing him. Uh, so this is a truly uh, appalling sort of example. Most of the lynchings, uh, they're all appalling, obviously, but uh, the sadism, uh, the torture uh, of the, the Leavenworth case is unusual. Most of the incidents were hangings or some combination of hanging, shooting, uh, and dragging uh, individuals. Uh, now, lynching is has become sort of the form of violence that most historians study. Uh, and effectively, in a lot of cases, you'll see that you know, the term of racial or racist violence, however it's conceptualized, is usually synonymous with lynching. Uh, and I didn't want to do that in my study, uh, but I, you know, lynching is obviously the most visible form of racial violence. So some of the other types of violence that I examined included race riots, which also, like lynchings, are, are fairly well known. Uh, most of the lynchings that historians study and write books on and so on are incidents like the Tulsa race riot, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention. Obviously, we just passed the centennial of the Tulsa race riot of 1921. Uh, the Chicago race riot of 1919, the East St. Louis race riot of 1917. These are some of the really well-known incidents. They usually involve high death tolls, extensive destruction of property. And the cases of race riots that I focused on in Kansas are really not like those cases at all. It's very easy to miss them altogether. Uh, for example, in 1904, the little town of St. John out in Stafford County had a race riot. Okay, this is involved indiscriminate attacks on the African American community by white mobs, right? So, whereas a lynching is a targeted attack on a particular individual accused of some kind of infraction, uh, and his, it's always his in these cases, his infraction and his punishment is meant to send a message to the whole African American community. With race riots, the mob just attacks anybody and everybody, right? Uh, so they attack houses, they burn them down, they attack black people in the streets, they beat them up, sometimes they kill them and so on. This case in St. John, though, as I said, is nothing like those big cases in Chicago and St. Louis. So in that case, you've got a threatened lynching, followed by some kind of a fight between African Americans and whites, it's not too clear what happened, and then the burning of two or three African American homes, right? So these are not as I said, epic events like the ones in big cities, but they're very locally significant. And sometimes following these kinds of riots, you'll see the white population drive the whole African-American population out of town or push them into some segregated area outside of town uh, or whatever the case may be. Probably the two biggest race riots in Kansas history would be the Hayes race riot of 1869. Uh, and that First of all, there was a lynching of three African-American soldiers in January of 1869. And then a few months later in uh, April or May, I think it was May 1869, there was a riot uh, in which about six black soldiers were killed and three uh, other African-American uh, residents were also killed. And the entire African-American population was driven out of town. The other one comes at sort of the, the other end of the period and this is in El Dorado in 1916. Uh, it was a very fast expanding town. All kinds of people, white and black from all over the country, poured into that town in 1915 and 1916. Uh, and at the end of the year, uh, in December 1916, there was a riot uh, and the entire population of African Americans were driven out. It was about 200 or so. Uh, a third type of violence is what I call mobbing. And Mobbing is sort of like lynching, with the essential difference being that the victim is not killed, right? So if we have a lynching where a particular person is targeted for violence, we have riots where a mob attacks the Black community generally, mobbing is back to attacking one particular person accused of some kind of offense, but the punishment is not 
lethal. So typically whippings and tar and featherings are probably the two most common uh, forms of mobbing. And there are some uh, really striking cases. So 1876 in Marysville, uh, up in uh, Marshall County, there was a circus. First of all, Marysville was an all white town. And I'll be talking about sundown towns a little bit later, but Marysville was all white. A uh, circus came into town. There was a, a few African-American uh, employees and somebody accused one of these African-American employees of stealing his watch. And so he was arrested. And so you have to sort of imagine a circus and a big crowd of white people watching the circus act. And the, the head of the circus brings in these two African-American men who've been accused of stealing a watch and they tie them up with nooses and they hang them. And they repeatedly hang them up and down to try to force them to admit to stealing the watches. So they tortured them for the amusement of this circus uh, audience. And then after they got the confession, uh, they then put them into a cage with a hyena, which is part of the circus show as well, chained them into the cage with these hyenas, put them on the train and sent the train drop down the tracks, right? So if you're an all white town like Marysville, and these two black men come to town with the circus, you've sent a very strong message to any other African-Americans that might come and visit. Uh, there's another case in 1892 in the town of Ozaki, uh, which in that case, an African-American man was arrested for living with a white woman and possibly running a brothel. Uh, that's, that was an allegation. I, I'm not sure that's true at all, but uh, they arrested him and they took him out of jail and they whipped him at the edge of town and castrated him and drove him out uh, of the town. And he went up to Oskaloosa uh, and he was kicked out of that town as well. And an important thing about cases like that uh, is that in some cases you can commit a non-lethal act of violence against somebody, but they could subsequently die, right? So this man in Ozaki, I have no record of what happened to him after he's castrated and driven from Jefferson County, he may well have died, in which case we would have to reclassify him uh, as a lynching. So that would be mobbings. Uh, so those are all the sort of mob type violence that I that I identified. Uh, but I also identified things like police violence. And obviously, this is an issue with a great deal of meaning in contemporary America as well. Uh, first of all, without getting into this too much, one of the things that you see very clearly is that lynching skyrockets in the late 1860s and early 70s, then it declines a little bit in the late 70s, it shoots back up in the 80s. Uh, and then it sort of, there continues to be lynchings throughout the century, but really lynching starts to decline by the 1890s and into the 20th century. But as lynching goes into a nosedive, you see the number of killings by police officers skyrocketing, right? So the decline of lynching and the increase of police killings uh, are very much tied together. Now, I didn't, I found all kinds of killings of black people by police officers uh, in Kansas. And I did not include the overwhelming majority of the cases that I found. I, I just didn't include them, they're not in the book. They're not in the databases at the end of the book. And the reason is because even though it's very likely that in many of those cases, those were racist killings, what I did was I restricted myself to only those cases where the evidence makes it unambiguous that this was a racially motivated killing. Uh, and it had a great deal of racial significance, uh, or where the evidence is clear that, you know, the police officer said he was defending himself, but the black person who was killed was shot three times in the back, right? So when somebody gets shot in the back, it's pretty clear they were not actually attacking. Uh, so police violence, uh, very flagrant cases. Uh, I found many of these kinds of flagrant cases where there's disproportionate violence, undue force, no real justification. Uh, so as I indicated, there's a difficulty in studying police violence, and this is true again in the present and in the past, because the person who's, who's been killed is dead, obviously can't tell their story, and the police officer can always claim, you know, I was doing a dangerous job, and I had to defend myself. And obviously, in some cases, that, that may be true. So I restricted myself to cases where the claim was self-defense, but as I said, the black person was shot in the back repeatedly, uh, or they claimed that the black person made a move as if to pull a gun. This is a very common phrase. You know, I don't know what that means, but apparently police officers in the 1890s knew what it looked like when a black guy was about to pull a gun uh, 
and they would preemptively shoot this person, right? So, uh, and you'll still see that kind of language well throughout the 20th century with respect to police violence, where it's always self-defense and somebody made a move as if to pull uh, a gun. <clears throat> now, when these killings occurred, you could say, well, maybe this person you know, would be prosecuted or arrested and the crime would be investigated in one way or another. That is typically not what we see with these police killings. So the killing will occur, often it'll occur in a public place, uh, you know, on the street in front of large numbers of onlookers. Uh, the whites will rally behind the officer, they'll cheer for him, they'll say, man, you should give more of that kind of medicine to some of the other blacks in this town. Uh, newspapers will come out and say that the police officer did the right thing. Uh, there'll be these, as I said, claims of self-defense that don't really stand up to scrutiny. Uh, there will be no prosecution, or if there is a prosecution, it's because African-Americans hire an attorney to prosecute. And in every single case that I identified, the police officer was acquitted, no matter how egregious uh, and flagrant the case. Uh, there's a case in Bassett in, uh, I believe it was 1904. This is a little town in Allen County near Iola. Uh, where a white officer kills a black guy under very suspicious circumstances. African-Americans are very angry about this. Uh, and the white population arms itself, defends the police officer, say they will protect him. African-Americans demand that he be fired from the police force and the whites demand that he stay on the police force, right? So uh, in some cases, they'll even be officers who will be held in jail because African-Americans are so angry that they're afraid something will happen to the police officer if he's out on the streets and whites will guard the jail, right? So these kinds of killings really mobilize racial division uh, and uh, white unity in ways that are similar uh, to, to lynchings. Another type of uh, racist violence is homicides. Uh, and homicides, of course, are non-police officers, almost always white men attacking and killing uh, black people uh, under no, you know, there's usually not even a pretext. It's often at a saloon or in the street and they just walk up and club somebody in the head of the bottle or stab them or shoot them. Uh, a very good case of this actually occurred in Topeka in the spring of 1865, right at the end of the war, uh, where a black man, a prominent black man of property who had aroused anger among whites uh, for being prominent, he walked out of a saloon and a white man walked up with a straight razor and just sort of cut his jugular right in the middle of the street, uh, again, in front of a large crowd of people. So uh, homicides and police killings are, are both incidents where you have an individual acting out an act of violence, but it is endorsed by the community. Uh, as with police officers, whites who commit homicides almost never are arrested. Uh, if they are arrested, they're not prosecuted. If they are prosecuted, they're acquitted. Uh, there's a couple of white guys of low status who do in fact end up going to jail for short terms, not for killing African-Americans, but in general, that's not the case. Now, with both police killings and homicides, uh, what I just really wanted to stress, and I already sort of said this in explaining them, but you get this sort of crowd response. So with lynchings and race riots and mobbings, you get a crowd, right? You get a spectacle, you get a black person being punished by a white crowd and everyone's sort of cheering. It's the same thing with police and homicides, right? They happen in the streets, large numbers of people are cheering. Uh, bodies are frequently, black people's bodies are frequently left laying in the streets for hours. So, you know, the whole town can file by and make comments, disparaging comments. Sometimes bodies are taken to uh, the, the, the funeral home and the whole town will sort of pass by the body and make comments uh, and so forth. So there's, there's crowds in that sense. Uh, there's a case in Ellenwood, uh, out in the western part of the state in 1899, and Ellenwood is also an all-white sundown town, where on the 4th of July, 1899, an African-American man came into town on the train. He came off the train. He was met by a crowd of probably drunken, because it was the 4th of July, drunken white men led by the sheriff, and the sheriff ended up shooting and killing this guy with 15 or 20 white men uh, around him, right? So it is kind of a mob style of incident, even though it's one person uh, committing the attack. Just another incident that I'd like to discuss as well. This is in 1894 in the town of Newton down in Harvey County. And in this case, a black man was shot and killed by two white railroad workers. Uh, and 
apparently this black guy had been trying to steal a ride on the train and these two white guys shot and killed him. Uh, and these two white guys were not arrested. And so the African-American population was outraged that these two guys had not been arrested and they went downtown to protest. So you've got a small group of African-Americans protesting the failure to arrest these two white guys for shooting a black guy. And then a huge crowd of whites forms and they beat up these black protesters and then put them in jail. And then when they're in jail, the crowd then threatens to storm the jail and lynch these black protesters, right? So again, a murder turns into something that is a big deal in Newton, Kansas. So Newton didn't actually have a lynching, but I would submit that this incident in 1894 would be Newton's lynching, right? It's an act, a spectacular act of white violence that makes it very clear who has the power uh, and who does not have the power. Now, the last kind of violence that I've discussed is rape. Uh, most of the kinds of violence that I've just discussed, the victims were African-American men, overwhelmingly. That's not always true in race riots uh, or when houses are burned down or whatever, African-American women are losing the property as well. Uh, but African-American women suffer endemic sexual violence, okay? It's hard to find this violence against them because it happens in private usually, and white newspapers are not going to report these things. One, it's not you know, it's not news around town, it's, it's private. And two, they're not gonna to wanna to admit that white men are perpetrating the same kinds of rapes that white men are using as justification for attacking uh, African-Americans. However, you can find some incidents in newspapers and in other sources, and the way they discuss these rapes makes it very clear that these are very common incidents indeed. Uh, they happen a couple of different ways. Sometimes they happen on the streets, women are waylaid and dragged into alleys, but more commonly they are attacked at work. So domestic workers, women who work in white people's houses uh, are attacked by the men in those houses, either physically overwhelmed or basically told if you wanna to continue to have a job, uh, you have to submit to this. Uh, so sexual assault is very, very common. Uh, one really striking incident of sexual assault that I came across was in 1895 in Wichita, a woman named Daisy House. And she had left her home and she was coming home from a store. And as she was walking in the house, these two white guys came in after her, uh, tied her up, raped her, stabbed her with kitchen utensils uh, and so forth. And then they escaped and they were arrested and put in jail. Uh, African-Americans were very upset and a large crowd of African-American men formed at the jail and threatened to lynch these guys. And of course, in this instance, the police were not going to allow lynching uh, and they ultimately just let these white guys go. They just released them and they left and they were never prosecuted. Uh, so you can see that the sheer hypocrisy of the way these sexual systems uh, operate. Now, in addition to these types of violence, I wanted to just talk a little bit about sundown towns, which I've alluded to. These are all white towns. Uh, they maintain their all whiteness by simply not allowing African Americans and sometimes other minorities to live in these towns, or in some cases, even to visit uh, these towns. Uh, the reason they're called sundown towns is because in at least some of these places, uh, African Americans were allowed to come into town during the day, but when the sun set, when the sun went down, they had to be out of town. Uh, African Americans found in town after dark could be subject to all kinds uh, of violence. Uh, from what I could see in my studies of uh, sundown towns in Kansas, it seems like sundown towns just in Kansas anyway, they just, there were just no black people in those towns day or night. Uh, but it's hard to tell. They don't put their their uh, policies necessarily in the newspapers. Uh, James Lowen wrote a book on sundown towns about 15 years or so ago now, uh, and it has really sort of generated a lot of fruitful discussion uh, about understanding racism in the rural Midwest. Uh, Dr. Lowen unfortunately died uh, several weeks ago. Uh, the most notorious sundown towns in Kansas, which I probably Hayes would be the most notorious as I indicated, there was a race riot and a triple lynching there in 1869. Uh, there was another riot in 1872. African-Americans were once again uh, sent fleeing. And then in 1882, there were two different killings uh, of African-Americans, one in January and then one in December of 1882. And effectively, Hayes was an all-white town. 
thereafter. Uh, J- James Liker has a very good article uh, on the Hayes Race Riot of 1869 in the Great Plains Quarterly, and I believe about 1997. Uh, <clears throat> Liberal Kansas is also a sundown town. It had been a sundown town uh, when it was formed effectively. A few African Americans moved in there in the early 20th century, and they were kicked out in a riot in 1909. There's nothing known about the riot. Uh, the only sources for telling us that a riot occurred were white local liberal newspapers. And wh- what they said essentially was a whole bunch of good men, by which they meant white men in this town, took their guns and went out and visited all the African Americans, and all the African Americans are now gone. Right. So we don't know what happened. Do they go out and threaten them and tell them to leave? Do they go out and beat some people up and force them to leave? Do they burn their houses? We just don't know. But we do know that they drove out the entire uh, black population. Hoisington, also a sundown town from the moment it was formed in the 1880s. Uh, small black population moves there around 1910. And there's a lynching in 1912, and the entire African American population is driven out. And Hoisington, just over and over and over again throughout the 20th century, uh, there are ugly incidents uh, that occur there. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to just move over and just talk a little bit about African American resistance to racist violence. Uh, And here I'm going to be talking a lot about resistance to lynching uh, more than racist violence more broadly. Uh, So African-American resistance was uh, vibrant in this period, uh, notwithstanding some of the assumptions that African-Americans were sort of passive victims uh, of white racism in this period. So, of course, African-Americans fought back against racist violence in all kinds of different ways. Uh, They... uh, launched court cases and of course very famously in 1954 one of those Kansas challenges brings down segregated school right but before that in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century there were court cases particularly challenging uh, segregated schools there were black newspapers Kansas had lots and lots of black newspapers uh, and there were they created associations to fight racism some of them were little local organizations Leavenworth had several of those Uh, And some of them were local or state branches of groups like the NAACP, uh, which of course was a national group. Uh, Sean Alexander, who is a professor at KU, has a great piece on the formation of the Kansas branch of the Afro-American Council. That's also in the Great Plains Quarterly in, I believe, 2007. So there's a lot of good work. And of course, my book as well talks about how African-Americans organized institutionally to oppose racist violence. But what I really want to focus on here today is on one particular type of resistance, which I call jailhouse defenses. And jailhouse defenses are cases where African Americans knew, learned that there was going to be a lynching. Uh, And I say learned because sometimes you might hear that there was a lynching planned. uh, But in other cases, you would just see thousands of white people downtown outside the jail. And that made it abundantly clear that Uh, a lynching could be in the offing. So African-Americans would hear about these events. They would suspect that police were not going to intervene and there could be a lynching. And of course, as we've discussed, a lynching against one African-American is an attack on the entire African-American community. So African-Americans would arm themselves and go down to the jailhouse or the courthouse or wherever the the prisoner was being kept and would defend the prison. Uh, defend and stand up against the mob if and when uh, it arrived. Uh, So these could be quite dramatic events in which a very large white crowd, in some cases hundreds or even thousands of white people at the jail, uh, jawing with, arguing with a small group of African Americans. And it's really kind of inspiring uh, to sort of see how a determined group of people wanting to protect the life uh, of one of their community members can stand up against such a massive group. Uh, There's a case in 1903 in Topeka uh, where something like seven or 800 whites are gathered at the jail and there's a small group of like 20 or 30 black guys staring them down, right? So that's a a pretty shocking uh, mismatch to say the least. And yet in virtually every case, either neither side broke and ran and they both just sort of stood staring at each other or the whites were the ones who left. Never, uh, almost never, I'll get to the the couple of exceptions, but almost never did the African-Americans break and run, even when confronted with much larger groups. 
Most of these jailhouse defenses involve small groups, 10, 12, 20, 30, 50 African-Americans, and some of them involve up to like 500. Uh, there are cases in Eudora, Tonganoxie, uh, Wyandotte, uh, a whole bunch of cities in the eastern part of Kansas where we get events where literally 500 African-Americans show up. They block every entrance to the jail. They take over several city blocks. They search white people, right? So a white guy's walking down past the city hall and the African-Americans stop him and search him down, ask him where he's going, detain him, tell him he can't go that way, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, they organize very quickly and very effectively. So through word of mouth, there's a mob forming, uh, often under the leadership of a, a pastor, African-Americans will come together uh, and, and, and go down uh, and face down that crowd. Uh, overwhelmingly, men are the ones who participate in these events. I did not find a single case in Kansas where Black women participated in these jailhouse defenses. However, I believe strongly that, that Black women uh, probably were involved in them. White newspapers have an incentive not to talk about these events at all, and certainly never to admit that Black women are the ones who chase them off. But uh, one case I would draw your attention to is in Oklahoma. Uh, in 1913, in the town of Wagner, Oklahoma, there was a pregnant black woman named Marie Scott who was lynched by a mob. Uh, and about two years later, in the neighboring town of Muskogee, there were two black men arrested and a crowd went down uh, to storm the jail. And according to several newspaper accounts, a large group of black women carrying shotguns opened fire on this crowd of white men who then ran for the hills and they were chased by these black women with, with machine or with, uh, with, with shotguns, right? So that's the only case I really know of where women clearly took a leadership role, but I suspect uh, there are more cases like that. And in that particular case, according to the Chicago Defender anyway, these black women then hammered a note on the jailhouse door saying that black women would be respected in Oklahoma, therefore, from that moment forth. Uh, that probably didn't happen. It was probably a little bit of artistic license by the editor, but still uh, an interesting uh, example. Uh, Tonganoxie, 1892, a little town in Leavenworth County, had maybe the single most dramatic uh, jailhouse defense. Uh, and in this case, a farmer named Noah Ashby, black farmer was arrested for allegedly raping a 16 year old white girl. A white doctor, uh, evaluated this girl and said that she had not been raped, but this man was arrested anyway, and a mob said they were going to lynch him. Uh, a black attorney, very prominent civil rights attorney uh, up in, uh, in the city of Leavenworth named W.B. Townsend took the case for Ashby, and he was gonna go down to defend him in Tonganoxie. And when the whites in Tonganoxie heard that Townsend was coming down, they said they were gonna lynch Ashby and they were gonna lynch Townsend. Uh, and so Townsend, organized a large group. Uh, 25 young black men joined him on the train ride down to Tonganoxie. They were all well armed. And when they got there, uh, two or 300 more African-American men came into town pulling wagons that were loaded with, with guns. Uh, and they camped around the, the courthouse. And of course, there was no lynching. Right? And then, of course, the Tonganoxie Mirror, the white newspaper, came out and said, oh, we were never going to do that to begin with. Uh, right. But <laughs> In all likelihood, they would have tried to commit a lynching if African Americans uh, had not been there. Uh, so between 1890 and 1916 alone, uh, there were 22 such jailhouse defenses in Kansas. I suspect there were many more than that. Uh, the reason I could only find 22 uh, cases is largely because these were usually only covered in African American newspapers or in the most minimal way possible in white newspapers. Uh, so there's a lot of other cases where I suspect what happened was that African Americans armed, but it's not entirely clear. So these jailhouse defenses are very important to our understanding of African American history in this period uh, because, to a very large extent, historians have argued that. African Americans really didn't fight back physically until around World War I. There's this whole new Negro, it emerges out of World War I. They realize that they've been oppressed and they've gone off to fight in this war and now they're back and they're gonna go down fighting, right? And it's a great story, 
And it's a true story. Certainly lots of African-American veterans fought after World War I and World War II and every other war in American history for the rights that they had been deprived of. Uh, but it isn't really true that it starts in World War I. So African-Americans are defending themselves uh, very aggressively as early as the 1870s and 1880s and in large numbers by the 1890s. And it's very clear uh, that there would have been a lot more lynchings in Kansas in this period uh, had it not been for African-American resistance. Uh, so in, if you just take those 22 cases, right, that would be 22 more lynchings. In fact, in this period, there were only nine lynchings, right? Between 1890 and uh, 1916, there were nine lynchings and 22 lynchings prevented by African-Americans. So obviously there would have been a lot more if it hadn't been for African-American resistance. Now, I mentioned before, in some cases with these acts of armed self-defense, uh, it, it turned into something else. I mean, in, in two cases, it turned into uh, a riot. So uh, in, in every case I found up until 1916, when African-Americans went to the courthouse, whites would invariably leave and go home. Oftentimes the white newspapers would report that better counsels prevailed among the whites, right? That's one way of saying, you know, white people just decided we didn't want to do this. We didn't want to embarrass the town with a lynching. And so they people all went home. Uh, another art thing that white newspapers often said is that a storm came up, right? So the whites are at the jail. Uh, There's a case in Pittsburgh in 1893 where there's hundreds of whites at the jail and they were just about to storm the jail. And then a thunderstorm came and they all ran for cover. And that that killed the lynching, right? Well, that the white people like that story, right? That these guys decided to take off because of the storm. But if you read the black newspapers, you'll see that in fact, black guys were at the jail, they opposed the mob and the white guys decided they didn't want to get shot. And so they went home, right? Uh, so you really need to study uh, uh, African-American newspapers if you want to get a, a sort of full view of what happens with these jailhouse defenses. So in 1920, uh, in Independence, there is another one of these jailhouse defenses. Uh, and in that particular case, a conflict starts uh, and uh, this leads to a race riot in which uh, several people are killed, one white guy uh, and one black guy. Same thing happens in Coffeeville in 1927 uh, where a threatened lynching followed by armed resistance by African-Americans leads to a race riot. Uh, and both of those happened in Montgomery County within a seven year period. But overwhelmingly, uh, these incidents ended without any kind of lynching or any kind of violence. Now, in addition to these acts of jailhouse defenses, I also just wanna talk a little bit about black on white mob violence, which was kind of a surprise to me when I, when I found it when I was doing this research. And that is to say, not only did African-Americans you know, organized to defend themselves from white mobs, but in some cases they responded to acts of racist violence with mob violence of their own. Uh, they knew that this white person wasn't to be arrested and so they tried to sort of take vengeance uh, themselves. And a couple of incidents I think will make the point here. Uh, there's a case in, in Wichita in 1898, we see a lot of these cases take place in Wichita. Uh, there was an attack in the rail yards against an African-American woman who was making her way home from work and she was attacked by this white man who dragged her into an empty car and proceeded to try to sexually assault her. She screamed and there were some black men working up the road and they heard her and they came down. And pretty soon you have a crowd of 50 or 60 African-Americans beating this white man and making threats to lynch him. The police showed up and they were able to kind of drag this guy away and get him to jail and prevent him from being lynched. And you won't be surprised to learn that what did they do to this white guy? They just sort of let him go, right? They let him out of jail and he disappeared. Uh, another case outside of Pittsburgh, and again, Pittsburgh is another city that has a lot of these incidents. Uh, there is a manhunt for an alleged murderer uh, and white posses are out sort of in the countryside looking for uh, so-called suspects. And they see an African-American man and they chase him into uh, an abandoned, or into a mine shack essentially, and they decide to wait for him outside the mine shaft. And so they set up camp and, you know, they're camping. 
And at night, a large group of African-Americans surrounds this white posse and disarms all of them, takes their guns, uh, and so on. So in that case, you see a posse being foiled by African-American resistance. Uh, and then a third case takes place in Leavenworth, the city of Leavenworth in 1888. Uh, and in this case, a white guy shoots uh, three African-Americans in a fight. Uh, a huge crowd of African-Americans forms spontaneously on the spot and they chase this guy to a utility building and they're again threatening to lynch him. Hundreds of African-Americans threatening to lynch this man. The mayor shows up and tries to get the crowd to disperse and they would have none of it. And so finally they had to call in troops from Fort Leavenworth to come in and get this white guy and get him out of there to prevent him from being lynched by African-Americans. Okay, I'm gonna stop there uh, and see what we can do in the way of questions. It looks like I overdid my time a little bit. <laughs> oh, you did a fantastic job. That was perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, first off, uh, right after you started speaking, uh, Virgil Dean, who has worked with us for many, many years, uh, wanted to point out uh, all of the articles you have published uh, in OR, uh, Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains. So I got those links. I posted them in the chat. So uh, right. go ahead, open those up, uh, keep, them, keep them open in your browser. So afterwards, you can check them out. Um, Thanks, Virgil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, where can we go to purchase your book? Uh, well, it's, I mean, I'm not encouraging anyone to get it on Amazon, but go to uh, <laughs> University of Illinois Press uh, and pick up a copy. And regarding that, uh, can you talk a little bit about the cover? It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had nothing to do at all with the cover. Uh, that, that was done by uh, the University of Illinois Press. I agree. It's, it's, it's a really thought-provoking cover. Powerful. I had nothing to do with it though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, first uh, question from uh, our viewers. What stopped sympathetic white people slash women from protesting against horrific murders of black men? Can you repeat that? Yeah, what stopped sympathetic white people from protesting against horrific murders of black men? Well, um, that's a really great question. And I mean, in the 1860s and 70s, uh, there actually were more, I don't know if there were actually more liberal or uh, sympathetic whites or whatever term you want to use, but they had a, they were able to speak out more. So the idea of racial justice had a lot more traction in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, but there was such a welter of violence in this period that I think it sort of intimidated those white people into silence, right? By the 18, in fact, the, the lynching in Lawrence in 1882 uh, was right after the exodus influx of 1879 and 1880. It, it happened in Lawrence, which was, of course, a university town. It was also seen as a sort of racially liberal town. It was the abolitionist free state. And so the idea that three black men would be lynched from a bridge in Lawrence, I think was just sort of an indication of how sort of racially conservative the state was going. And from that point forward, you really don't see a lot of courageous white people anymore. They may oppose it, but they don't really speak out. And then eventually, uh, you know, you're swept along so that by about 1900, all the white liberals by that time are extremely conservative. If you look at white liberals in 1900 and the same person writing 30 years before, they're way more conservative racially uh, than they were before. As for women, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of women were involved in lynching uh, or at the very least, you know, set white men against African Americans for a whole variety of reasons. So I'm not sure. Like the idea that white women would be opposed to lynching more than white men isn't clear to me. Like, I think they both had a strong investment in that kind of action. Great answer. That was a, a pretty tough, tough question. Uh, kind of going off of that, another one from uh, Sandra. Uh, this despicable violence is a historical part of Kansas. Is Kansas worse than other states in the Midwest or in the U.S. overall when it comes to this topic? Um, well, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, 
you know, if you look at the number of lynchings in Georgia, for example, there are way more than there are in Kansas. But in Georgia, African Americans live everywhere, rural areas, urban areas. Uh, and so you would have a lynching in just about every town in order to fight, enforce white supremacy. In Kansas, because there are so many sundown towns, and frankly, virtually, I, I'd say most of the towns in Kansas were sundown or nearly sundown towns. So if all the African Americans settle in a handful of larger cities like Topeka, Lawrence, Atchison, Leavenworth, uh, et cetera, you're gonna have all the lynchings occurring in those places where African Americans live. So if you have 20 lynchings in Kansas, but that's all the concentration areas of African Americans, then basically every African American in Kansas has experienced a lynching uh, locally. And of course, being banned from most of the state, you know, you'll be killed if you come here is a good way, of course, of preventing lynchings, right? There aren't any black people, therefore you won't have any lynchings. So is it better or worse? I would say it's just different. My second book focused on the Midwest more broadly. I looked at Missouri uh, and Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, and you know, they're all terrible. I mean, frankly, I, all, all of those states uh, had very similar kinds of violence. Wherever African Americans lived, they were targeted. I, I know you use the term uh, terrorize uh, quite, quite a bit. Would you classify uh, this white violence as terrorism? I would definitely. I mean, the word terror, obviously, the word terrorism is very charged in our own time and so on. But if that means intentional actions done to, uh, you know, achieve a particular outcome, which is to subordinate African Americans, then certainly that is terrorism. Well, thank you. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, nice comment from Debbie here. Uh, thank you for this informative webinar. Uh, it is a painful part of Kansas history that so few people are aware of. It's good to make us all aware of it. Thank you, Debbie. Um, a question from Mary here. Um, she is interested in how you got uh, into this topic, how you started researching it. Well, you know, I did my, my, my master's at KU and the subject was uh, how, did, how did whites in Lawrence maintain Jim Crow? from 1945 to 1960. And when I was doing that, so many people, I would, you know, I spent a lot of time in coffee shops and people would always frequently say things like, well, you won't find much in Kansas. It was the free state, you know? And it was really strange because it was like, you know, this was completely Jim Crow town and state until the 1960s, uh, but it's such a prevalent idea. And so when I went down to Georgia, to Emory for, for my PhD, my intention was to do Southern history. And when I got down there, I started thinking that it would be interesting to take a Southern sort of framework of lynching and apply or racial violence and apply that to the Midwest and see if the Midwest really looked all that different. And in some ways it does look different, i.e. sundown towns, banning of African-Americans in the Midwest, versus large numbers of African-Americans in rural areas in the South. And that, you know, that's gonna create a whole lot more lynchings, for example, in the South. Uh, but as I said, they're all bad. Uh, the only state I would say where there was no violence against African-Americans would be states where there were no African-Americans. Um, so. The, uh, when you first started answering that question, um, kind of talking about that free state narrative that, uh, has really always been prevalent in Kansas. I think one one thing that your book does so well is just deconstruct that that kind of myth of the free state. Um, and I think so many Kansans uh, really don't understand where, where we have come from and like to really buy into that because it, it it sounds good, it feels good, right. um, but the the truth is sometimes a little less. Uh, Positive. Well, I think part of the, for me too, you know, I grew up in Ontario as a kid until I was a teenager. I lived in Ontario and Ontario has a very similar story about itself to Kansas, right? This is where, you know, underground to Canada and, you know, enslaved people would escape to the North. And the stories that I received as a youth in Canada, you know, in an all white class with a, a white teacher was like, look how wonderful Canada is. Like they, and, and, right. you know, the, in the storybooks, you know, these enslaved people would get to Canada and all the white people were so wonderful and kind and so on. Uh, and it's the same story, right? So when I got out to Kansas, it was just like, okay, this is like Ontario, but on steroids, uh, the Kansas Free State narrative. 
Uh, all right, so let's move on to another one here. They just keep rolling in. <laughs> so uh, in the course of your research, have you come across instances of white women being lynched or jailed for consensual sexual relations with African-American men? Uh, yes, I have found cases where they were jailed. Um, I found cases where they were run out of town. Um, there's a case in Columbus uh, in Cherokee County in 1875 where an African-American man and a white woman who were married came to town uh, and they were attacked by a mob who beat the man up and took him to the edge of town and kicked him out. And then they gang raped the woman uh, like all night. Uh, in that case, there was one account of it in the local newspaper, and then they never mentioned it again for obvious reasons. Uh, and it sounds like from the account that the guys involved were like the sons of prominent men in town and so on. So, uh, so yeah, that kind of stuff certainly did happen. Usually they were just ridiculed for being unattractive uh, if they were in a relationship with an African-American man. I did find a case, uh, a white woman who was almost lynched for infanticide in uh, around Augusta, that area, uh, around 1893. And it's a really interesting case because she was apparently a heavy woman. And there's a quote in there about uh, hoist up a 300 pounder, which is really interesting to me because it you know, has a lot of resonance with a lot of issues about shaming and bodies and so forth from our own time. It never in a million years would have occurred to me that that kind of uh, body shaming would lead to an attempted lynching. She was not killed, but she was tortured by this crowd. Uh, so yeah, but that's a different case that didn't involve uh, interracial sexuality. With kind of speaking about things that you don't expect to, to hear or see so far into the past. Um, one thing that you mentioned a lot uh, in the book and in this presentation uh, are instances of black men unarmed black men either fleeing or reaching for a gun. And, and we, we see that today quite frequently. Um, can you just uh, maybe expand on that a little bit more? Do you see a connection between your research uh, and what's happening today? Well, I certainly do. I mean, I certainly do see uh, connections uh, between today. Uh, the idea of reaching for a gun, I mean, the thing about it is, what does it mean, right? We can probably all in our minds imagine like, well, maybe what that looks like. But so frequently when someone went for a gun, they didn't have a gun, right? This dead person then ended up on the ground with no gun in his hand. So it's pretty clear that any movement that a black man made was fair game for a white person. You know, my fear that you might possibly pull the same weapon that I actually had in my hand will allow me to shoot you dead, right? So that's quite an interesting idea, right? That I have a gun, you don't have a gun, but if I think you might have one, I have the right to kill you, right? And I can get away with it because my life is inherently more important than yours. Uh, we have an, a question from Marvin um, talking about uh, jailhouse defenses. Uh, did the people of a town like Nicodemus get involved in, depend in defending African-Americans around the state? So different Not story. around the state, but certainly in that neck of the woods, uh, there were a number of incidents. Um, I mean, basically a lot of the, the white towns around Nicodemus, they were afraid of Nicodemus. They never went into Nicodemus. All the violence against African-Americans occurred in the towns around Nicodemus. Um, I, I didn't find any attacks on Nicodemus itself because, you know, obviously <laughs> you'd be going into a place where, you know, African-Americans have the home town advantage uh, and control everything. Uh, but uh, there was a case in, uh, in Nicodemus where a white guy shot a black guy outside of town and he was disarmed by some African-Americans and taken to Nicodemus. And very notably, they didn't lynch him. <laughs> and they wanted to sort of point that out. Hey, look, we're <laughs> going to give this guy a trial. Uh, so there was that incident, but no, nothing, uh, no jailhouse defenses that I, that I found in Nicodemus. Uh... Another question, uh, this one's from my good friend, Adam. Uh, was a large African-American population in a location protective against uh, racial violence committed against them? Or uh, was the tendency to attack smaller communities due to a perceived lack of ability to resist? Or did a higher population mean easier access for racists looking to send a message? I'd say all of the above. 
<laughs> if, that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, they, they certainly, where there were no Blacks, that usually indicated whites didn't want any Blacks. And so they were very likely to be kicked out. And some of those counties with very small Black populations, you you know, let's say there's 50 Blacks in 1870, there's 20 in 1880, there's four in 1890, there's zero in 1900, right? It's just sort of slow but steady uh, declines. But you know, the most violent places in the state, for the most part, are the places where there are the largest Black populations, uh, with Leavenworth uh, being chief among those. And Barton County, Barton County is a fascinating place because Great Bend had what they thought at the time locally was a large Black population. It was about 150 people. Uh, but it seemed it was like eight, eight or 10 percent, I think, of the local population. And there was a lot of violence in Great Bend. And then uh, Hoisington, which is just up the road, was a sundown town. So, and they had a lynching as well. Uh, so Barton County is a good example of both the urban and the rural pattern, I guess. Uh, with black only towns, uh, we've got a question from Sandra. Uh, how did they fare from white violence? Or I guess, so, so violence in black only towns. Uh, did you have white individuals purposely going into them? Uh, Not really, no. I mean, just Nicodemus is probably the only one that would really qualify as a black only town. And as I said, there were incidents around those towns, but not an actual invasion of those places. Um, a question I had, uh, were black newspapers preserved less frequently than white newspapers? So I know you use a lot of primary sources uh, from the black community. Um, yeah, I can't really speak to, cause I mean, there aren't that many of them that exist, but if that's because somebody made the decision not to preserve them or they're just, you know, they just didn't make it, you know, there weren't enough copies or whoever had them, maybe there was a house fire or whatever the case may be. So I don't really know uh, why there are so few. A lot of them are very short runs and there's just a couple of, uh issues but you know in some of those towns it's like how was there ever a black newspaper here to begin with so the idea that this paper didn't survive long is not surprising there's only 25 or 30 black people in the area um there's a few few like that all right well i think we are gonna wrap this up um we've had some amazing questions today uh this was a fantastic presentation uh I, before we started, I know you had said, haven't really had an opportunity to present on this topic for a while. So we mm -hmm. are very thankful that you could join us and we give you an avenue to talk about these, these uh, issues that really a lot of people don't know about. Um, and uh, comment from Peter here, great presentation, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, this will be archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a whole playlist with all of our Museum After Hours on it. Um, so definitely feel free to check that out. Um, and uh, I would really love it if you all joined us again next Friday or next month, Friday, November 12th at 630 to hear Dr. Latrice Donaldson present on her book, Duty Beyond the Battlefield, African-American Soldiers Fight for Racial Uplift, Citizenship and Manhood, 1870 to 1920. So quite a similar time period that we were discussing this, this month. Uh, Dr. Donaldson examines how black soldiers' military service shaped their desire for equal rights, demanding the country keep its promise that all men are created equal. Their civil rights work after the Civil War forever shaped the long civil rights movement. Uh, so as always, from all of us here at Museum 